let's get started. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Mount St. Helens National Volcanic Monument. On behalf of the U.S. Forest Service, welcome to Johnson Ridge Observatory. My name is Ranger Lucas and I am kind of the triple I here, the International Interpretive Intern, as I'm originally from Kiel in northern Germany. And once again, it's a very special day for me, with those of you who were here at my last talk one hour ago, but this is a very special day for me because my family arrived yesterday from Germany. Mm -hmm. So my brother and my father are here. Mm -hmm. And they surprised me, I had no idea. <laughs> so very special day today. Yeah, once again, welcome to Mount St. Helens. In case you haven't seen her, there she is. Mm -hmm. Behind the whatever smoky things from Canada. We have a big wildfire in British Columbia. So this is all smoke coming from uh, Canada today. So I really hope you can see Mount St. Helens a little more clearly during the afternoon. No guarantee, but in case you haven't seen her, there she is. They mm -hmm. actually told me it's a female mom. Mm -hmm. Mount St. Helens looked a little different 37 years ago. Like this. This was Mount St. Helens back in the year 1979, one year before the eruption. And this was a very beautiful and well-shaped iconic mountain here in the Pacific Northwest. People actually called that mountain Mount Fuji of the United States of America. But then something happened which changed the face and the look of Mount St. Helens from being a nice, well-shaped, beautiful volcano into a nice, well-shaped, beautiful volcano again, but with a little different face. And this happened in between nine hours of eruption time on May 18th, 1980, 8.32 in the morning all the way to the evening, changed the face of Mount St. Helens from this into this. And in this eruption, 57 people were killed, 230 square miles of area was destroyed, which is roughly the size of the city of Chicago. Over, uh, over 7,000 big game animals died, and over 11 million fish in Spirit Lake, the Tudor River, and the Columbia River. But this was actually just the climax, the high point of what we call an eruptive series. Because Mount St. Helens just did erupt once, there were several eruptions in that episode all the way to the year 1986. For example, there was one eruption one week after the May 18th, 1980 eruption, at May 25th. And that eruption brought ash all the way to Vancouver and Portland. Then we had more eruptions in June, in July, in September and October, and then we had two more eruptions in the year 1982, one in the year 1984, and actually the last one in the year 1986. And every time we had an eruptive event, Mount St. Helens changed her face again from being a nice volcano to what we see today. So what do you think when you hear the term lava? probably this, right? This is a picture taken from one of the Hawaiian volcanoes and you can see the nice red burning stuff running down the mountain. It's more like honey burning everything which is in its way. I have to disappoint you guys. We don't have that here. We don't have this nice lava floating down the mountain like honey. Our lava looks a little different. Our lava looks actually like this. This is a piece of rock which directly comes out of the crater of Mount St. Helens. Our lava has more silica in it. 65% of this rock is silica and it's also ironless, which means that this lava is cooler and is already a type of rock when it comes out of the mountain. So we have not floating stuff running down the mountain. This, mountain, uh, this type of lava is more like a rock coming out of the mountain. And this is called dacite and it's not like honey, it's more like peanut butter. And what happened during the 1980 through 1986 eruptive episode? Have a look on this picture. Unfortunately, you cannot see Mount St. Helens today, so we placed this picture right here. And you can see that the crater floor inside Mount St. Helens is actually not very flat. There is a big bulge inside the crater, and this is actually our lava flow. Our lava, which comes out of the mountain, we call it a lava dome. So anytime Mount St. Helens erupts, it creates a dome, a bulge of lava. And this is what has been there since the 1980s eruption ever since. So the eruption itself was pretty devastating. Everything was obliviated between us with an additional three miles in this direction. And as I said, 230 square miles of area was destroyed. Everything was covered in ash. So scientists believe, okay, it takes very, very long for nature to come back. Probably decades, maybe centuries. <laughs> it just took nature two years to come back. 
in the year 1982, the first plants came back into this area. When you go down to the parking lot, in a couple of minutes when you go back to your car, you can actually have a look to the right and to the left, and you can see little bluish uh, purple flowers. This is the prairie lupin, and the prairie lupin was the first plant, the pioneer plant coming back after the 1980s eruption. And today we have a big variety of plants and animals in this area. Just because the eruption itself was advantageous from three different perspectives. The first perspective actually was that it was early in the morning. And I'm going to introduce to you the hero of my little story. The hero is actually this little buddy right here. This is a pocket gopher. And all those rodents, speaking of pocket gophers, we also had chipmunks and squirrels and every kind of rodents in this area. But because it was early in the morning, those pocket gophers and other rodents had just returned to their burrows. And they had a huge tunnel system in this area. But very important, I'm only speaking of remote and isolated places only, not the area in front of us. This was all oblivion. But at remote and isolated places only, the lateral glass just went over the surface and those rodents had a chance to survive underneath the surface. But then something happened. As I said, they had a huge tunnel system, so when the elk came back into this area, they destroyed the tunnels by stepping over those tunnels. So the ash, which was on top of the surface, got mixed with the fertile soil underneath it, so the fertile soil was able to replant the na uh, nature in this area. So once again, rodents in the ground, huge tunnel system, elk destroying the tunnel system, and the ash was mixed with the fertile soil underneath it. The second perspective, the second advantageous moment was actually that it was early spring. So there were lots and lots of seeds in the ground which were just ready to get to the surface and grow new plants. And the third moment was actually that we had still lots and lots of ice shields in this area, lots and lots of snow patches because it was the late winter. So for example, at Mida Lake, which is 11 miles away in this direction, and as I said, this was a pretty remote and isolated place, was right behind a bridge covered from, uh, from Mount St. Helens Blast. But this area right here was still covered in snow. And those little trees right here had a chance to survive because the blast went over those snow patches and they, uh, the blast did not kill those trees. Mm. Same happened with Mida Lake. Mida Lake had a huge ice shield still. So all the amphibians and reptiles inside the lake had a chance to survive and they migrated back into Spirit Lake, for example. Speaking of Spirit Lake, the landslide which came down from the mountain created 183 new wetlands, including Coldwater Lake, which you passed on the way up here, and Castle Lake, you might have been able to see in this direction when you are outside on the Plaza Lake. And more ponds and little lakes in between the hummocks coming down from the mountain as a landslide. And those are pretty nice habitats for reptiles, amphibians, and also beavers. But then something happened in the year 2004. And to explain this, we first go back into the year 2003. And I'm going to show you what geologists look at at the David Alexander Johnson Cascade Volcanic Observatory in Vancouver, Washington, every day. How exciting is that? <laughs> this is actually a sample of one of the old-fashioned seismographic drum rolls we had in the observatory. And this is a pretty normal day for a geologist, even today when everything is digitalized. But this is a pretty normal day for a geologist in the uh, Cascade Volcanic Observatory. There is just one little earthquake right next to the blue star. Nothing else happened here in this uh, period of time at Mount St. Helens. This is just a sample of what the, uh, geologists look at every day. Pretty boring. But things get a little more interesting for geologists in the year 2004, September 23rd to 24th. Because you can actually see that the activity here at Mount St. Helens increased again. So we had a couple of earthquakes here happening day up to 200 every day with a magnitude point something up to one, maybe two. The biggest had actually a magnitude of 3.3. At this point, the geologists weren't actually sure is Mount St. Helens preparing for an eruption again. This wasn't the seismic uh, proof that magma is rising into the mountain again, but this was. So when they saw this by the end of September 2004, they were actually pretty certain that Mount St. Helens is going to erupt again 
pretty soon, and not as tremendous as 1980, but there will be an eruption, especially when they saw this. So the white of the paper of this old-fashioned dr uh, drum roll of the seismometer turned from white into purple. And we weren't actually sure, is it just a clue to close down Johnson Ridge Observatory or isn't? No, not yet, but this was actually the point when Mount St. Helens started another eruptive episode. What's, what happened at Mount St. Helens at this point? Yep, yeah, I heard it. An eruption! And this is actually a picture taken on October 1st, 2004. Mount St. Helens was erupting again. And this was just the start of an another eruptive episode here at Mount St. Helens. Very important. This is not comparable to what happened in the year 1980. Of course not. There was nothing left at Mount St. Helens to kick the pressure inside the mountain or cause another landslide. But still, it is an eruption and just the beginning of an another eruptive episode. So, the next part is actually a story my supervisor told me during training, because I was still a pubert in high school, had no idea of volcanoes in the year 2004, but he was here, and this was his first year, and he came up the highway, Highway 504, uh, one day after this eruption happened on October 2nd, and he saw this. The highway he came up, Highway 504, was crowded in cars. So he came up here to Johnson Ridge Observatory, ready to open Johnson Ridge Observatory. And before he opened the observatory, there were over 1,000 people here waiting for, an, in, for the eruption. By the peak of the day, we had 4,500 people here at the plaza deck, in the amphitheater, inside the observatory. They were all waiting for an eruption. Haven't they learned anything from 1980? <laughs> Even worse, we had 22 media trucks covering Lewis Lookout in Castle Lake Viewpoint and they broadcasted the mountain 24-7 to national television and international news channels. And the big problem actually was people were up here at the mountain on the observatory up on the plaza deck asking for what? Yeah, where is it? Yeah, where is what? Where is the mountain? The mountain is right there. No, they were actually looking for this. And once again, we don't have that here. <laughs> they were actually expecting a huge lava stream coming out of the mountain, burning everything inside the valley. Again, our lava is more sticky and cooler, and therefore not running like, uh, like honey uh, down the mountain, just like sticking on peanut, uh, like peanut butter sticking out of the mountain. And instead of a lava stream, they saw this. But this was actually on October 2nd, the point when we, as a forest service, and the U.S. Geological Survey decided to close down and evacuate Johnson Ridge Observatory. So we took down 4,500 people in 45 minutes. Wow. So we know what to do when this mountain is going to erupt. <laughs> but still, we closed the road behind the Science and Learning Center so nobody was allowed to go back to Johnson Ridge Observatory and on top of Johnson Ridge. But you can still see, this is the access road to Johnson Ridge Observatory. That is Science and Learning Center right here and the highway behind that point was still crowded in cars. As soon as there was one car leaving, another the one immediately pulled out and filled the space. They all wanted to see the eruption. Well, unfortunately for them, there wasn't any eruption on October 2nd, 3rd and 4th, but there was one on October 5th. And that was actually again the climax and the high point of that eruptive series and just the beginning of an, another lava dome to raising up into Mount St. Helens Crater. Because I actually told you a little lie a couple of minutes ago. Because when you look inside the crater of Mount St. Helens, you just find and see just one lava dome. You can see two. And I actually am able to point out that at this point here. So that is the lava dome of the 1980 through 1986 lava dome. When you have a look inside the crater, maybe not today, but mm -hmm. uh, at any other point, this section is a little darker than this section right here. And that is the 2004 through 8 lava dome, which came out after the eruption of October 5th, 2004. And as I said, the lava which came out of the mountain is iron-less and silica-rich. So it is pretty sticky, fragile, and cooler. So it comes out of the mountain as a big spine or whale back. And this is actually our lava flow, which comes out of the mountain. But the problem is, this thing right here is pretty fragile. What is made out of silica sand? Glass, correct. So this thing fell apart really quickly, and I'm going to show you four pictures in a row right now, 
which has been taken by a cam which was installed at the crater. So you can actually see the whaleback right here. This is picture number one. Then we have picture number two. This happened a couple of weeks later. And then a couple of days later, we had this. And then another couple of days later, we had this. this? And this is what you can actually see anytime you look inside the crater at this point. We have lots and lots of rock falls inside the crater. So when you see something which looks like an eruption at Mount St. Helens, it is probably just dust, which has been kicked up either by a rock fall or a wind gust. But this was actually a problem because this brought ash and dust into the atmosphere up to three to five miles. So there were pilots in the air sending radios to Portland Airport. Hey, haven't you seen your volcanoes erupting again? <laughs> Once again, it happens here every day and you can watch the seismic signature of one of the seismometers. You can see that the needle goes crazy as soon as there's a rock falling. You can see the dust plume, but this is not an eruption. So I mentioned that there is a lava dome inside the crater and we have a crater wall. And during the winter, we have lots and lots of snowfall in this crater. About 50 feet of snowfall inside the crater every year. So when this ice was pressed against the crater wall by the rising of the lava dome, something happened. Scientists wouldn't believe it when they saw it. They were very surprised in the year 2000 because they saw a glacier inside the crater. Junior rangers, pay attention now. So we don't only have a lava dome inside the crater, or two lava domes, we also have a glacier, and therefore the youngest glacier in the Cascade Range. And you can see it right here. That's the 1980-1986 lava dome, that's the 2004-2008 lava dome, and we have the eastern wing of the, uh, of the glacier and the west wing of the glacier. And you can also see them on these pictures right here. That is the eastern wing and that's the west wing. And they're still floating down the mountain with the speed of the size of your pinky every day. So this uh, glacier is pretty active. As I said, it's the youngest in the Cascades, but it's also the lowest in the Cascades. And that is the reason why the scientists were so surprised of seeing a glacier inside the crater. Because actually, the crater rim faces south, so it's been shade during the day and keeping the ice from melting away. And also, as you can see on this picture, our glacier is not white anymore, not at all spots, but also has lots and lots of rocks on top of it. So also, these rocks spend shade during the day and keeping the ice from melting away. And then something happened in May 2008. And this is the part of the story where I'd like to tell you that Mount St. Helens is also some kind of a bakery shop. Because in May 2008, the west wing and the east wing met. And now we are proud owners of not only the youngest and the lowest glacier, we also have a nice donut shaped glacier inside the crater of Mount St. Helens. But this is not the end of that story as Mount St. Helens being a bakery shop. Because we have lots of snowfall in the winter, rock falls in the summer, snowfall, rock falls, snowfall. So when you cut through the glacier, you can see a nice pancake stack. And lastly, since we have big boulders inside the glacier, when you cut through the glacier, in my opinion, the glacier looks like a good old German Streuselbuch. <laughs> so once again, we have the donut shaped glacier, we have the pancake stack, and the good old German Streuselbuch inside the glacier. But several times during my talk, I told you that we will know when this mountain is going to erupt. And I'm showing you why. Because we monitor this mountain in three different ways. And this is, for example, one of the seismometers we have placed inside the crater and around the mountain. Those things are actually pretty cheap. We can put them on helicopters, set them all around the, uh, the crater and the mountain. They have seismometers on board, uh, GPS, antenna, computers, batteries, everything. And we can put them everywhere we want, and we can measure the seismic activity inside the mountain. And when there is magma rising inside the volcano again, we will know if the Mount St. Helens is going to erupt soon. But nothing's happening at, at, at the moment. Also, we have placed snifflers we call snifflers around the mountain, especially on top of the lava domes. Those things can detect the gases coming out of the mountain. If there is more sulfur in the gases, or hydrogen, or carbon dioxide. We will know, okay, Mount St. Helens is preparing again for an eruption. But nothing is happening at the moment. And lastly, we have nice little toys placed around Mount St. Helens. For example, those reflectors right here. Would you just please hold that for me? You're Mount St. Helens now. And when Mount St. Helens is moving, we can measure that by shooting laser beams at those reflectors. 
That's the most annoying song ever. But when this reflector is moving, we will know Mount St. Helens is preparing for another eruption. But nothing is happening at the moment. Actually, this building right here at Johnson Ridge itself has moved one inch in this direction and one inch in this direction after the eruption. So, as I said, Mount St. Helens currently is exhaling. Nothing is happening, but be advised. Mount St. Helens is alive and well. Mm -hmm. And with these words, I'd like to thank you to coming up to Johnson Ridge Observatory today, purchasing your wristbands and giving us the fees. 90% of our budget comes from the fees you give us every day to maintain and operate this place, giving me from Germany a lifetime experience and you guys a functioning bathroom. So, vielen Dank, dass ich hier sein darf. Wiedersehen, tschüss and goodbye. ranger up at uh, Mount St. Helens and he just gave us that great ranger talk. So uh, Lucas, can you tell me, is Mount St. Helens the only volcano in Washington State? No. We have four more in Washington State. So for example, Mount Rainier, Glacier Peak, Mount Baker, and of course Mount Adams. Wow. So what is the potential of a volcanic eruption happening again in Washington State? Uh, it's not like a one-time deal. No, it's not a one-time deal. Um, there will be an eruption, probably within our lifetime, yeah. but uh, we don't know which volcano and we don't know when. Yes. Probably maybe Mount St. Helens since it's the most active one, but yes. who knows? The other four that you mentioned, are they also active at volcanoes? Yes, but St. Helens is the most active one. Uh, Mount Rainier is considered to be very active, so is Mount Baker, both Glacier Peak and Mount Adams I know. Dormant. Yeah. Yeah, but still active. Yeah. So, what changes have you noticed, or what changes happened in uh, the area in Washington State because of that great eruption in 1980? What are the biggest changes? So, the biggest changes when it comes to landscape happened only in the region around Mount St. Helens, in the okay. north and to the northwest. Okay. So, apparently, there was the size of the city of Chicago which got destroyed around the mountain, and also huge mud flows running down the Tula River Valley into the Columbia River. But the volcanic awareness is actually what was the most impact on society after the 1980s eruption. Because nobody expected an eruption to be that fatal and tremendous. Right. Now, I teach 7th grade students across the state. What would you say they need to know about Mount St. Helens, if nothing else? Um, I would say, first of all, it's, it's a volcano still, and it's very active and people should take care of everything when it comes to volcanic hazards like mud flows and eruptions and blasts coming out of the mountain so education is the big key right here you heard it here education is the big key not just your teacher says it smart people like lucas say it too thanks so much <laughs> lucas i appreciate you're welcome your time. thanks a lot thanks